Greetings and welcome to podcast 17 of Solar Coaster. And we're going to move into the diary of me by R. Kelly. And the topic today is the breakup. The story of the end of my marriage wasn't fiction. It was a real story, a sad story. Like most stories about long love affairs gone bad, it had lots of drama. In that way, I'm no different than millions of people struggling with their relationships. It gets good, it gets bad, it gets crazy. You want it to work because love is what brought you together. You want it to regain that love, make it new, make it stronger and hope to see um, to see you through it. You try like hell, you fail, but you get up and try again. If you have kids, you know how much they want mommy and daddy to stay together. Divorce scares kids, confuses them, and makes them think they're the ones who've done something wrong. The last thing in the world you want is a, to frighten your children and mess with their security. But life can pull a man in one direction and a woman in another. No matter how much you pray to stay together, life sometimes tears you apart. The collapse of my marriage happened during the seven-year period when the court case against me was building, while in reaction, my creative life was boiling. I knew that Drea wanted to do to be more than a dancer. Um, over time, it became difficult for her to accept that in our family. My career had always come before hers. I understood her frustration, but at the same time, she knew the deal going into the marriage. I never hid how important it was for me to have a stay-at-home wife. I knew myself well enough to understand that nothing else would make me happy. In the beginning, Drea seemed happy with that arrangement. <clears throat> But people change. They think they want one thing and then they realize they want another. That's life, I suppose. And that's why I started the dance studio where Drea choreographed two of my best tours. I thought that the studio would be enough. It wasn't. As time went on, Drea's resentment grew. I could understand that. It's no walk in the park being married to a man who likes to sing about sex and attract sexy women wherever he goes. I also can't say that I was as faithful as I wanted to be or should have been. That's another reason why Drea had lost patience with me. Towards the end, our arguments got nasty. Drea doesn't give ground and I don't either. If we were going out and I thought her hair was styled in a way that didn't bring out her beauty, she didn't want to hear about it from me. It's my hair, she snapped. I don't need you to tell me how to wear it. Baby, I said, you're a beautiful woman, but you don't have the right shape head to wear hair that high. That's your opinion, Robert. When I want your opinion, I'll ask for it. Well, excuse me, Drea, but by up until now, you've always been interested in my opinion, just like I'm interested in yours. Right now, I was I want to be left alone. So I left her alone. But the more time passed, the elephant in the room got so big until there wasn't any room left for the two of us. Once I was in the, the whirlpool at home, when I got out, I cut my foot on a bottle that I had left on the floor. The cut was bad and I was walking around the house. I left a trail of blood. It looked like a massacre. I was waiting for Drea to say something, show some concern, but she didn't say a word. Maybe she figured I could take care of myself and get to the doctor on my own. I didn't want that. I wanted her to care for me. She finally broke down, cried, and took me to the doctor. There were moments when we took care of each other's feelings and were still respectful. More and more, though, there were moments when she didn't want to deal with me and I didn't want to deal with her. We were living in the same house, but were a million miles apart. All right, I challenge her. If you really don't love me, I dare you to take off your wedding ring and throw it into the pond out back. Her wedding ring, by the way, cost $50,000. Drea took the dare. Plunk. Man, I can't believe it. I offered $10,000 to anyone who could fish that ring out of the pond. No one could. Living with me was rough. Under all the pressure, I had gotten out of shape and gained weight. I had gone from being R. Kelly to R. Belly. I was eating wrong and not getting enough sleep. I was irritable. Drea said I was taking my frustrations out on her. She was probably right, but I gave no ground. The way you're acting around here, I said, I don't think you love me anymore. She didn't answer. She knew her silence would make me mad. I said it again. I don't think you love me, Drea. Again, she said nothing. All right, I challenge her. If you really don't love me, I dare you to take off your wedding ring and throw it into the pond. 
You don't want to dare me, she said. The hell I don't. You might not like what the dare will make me do. I'm still I'm still daring you, I said. Drea took the ring off and, you know, she threw it in a pond. The drama built. Drea started talking about divorce. In a fit of anger, I told her I'd rather throw all my money into Lake Michigan than give her one cent. She said she'd take the children and one night she did. She was even able to get a restraining order against me. All this happened when my serious legal problems were getting more serious every day. To Drea's everlasting credit, though, she proved loyal when it really mattered. Even as we were stream rolling towards divorce, she never badmouthed me to the media. As a matter of fact, she did just the opposite. In a long interview with Essence magazine, Drea, the woman exiting my life at the time, vouched for me. When the writer asked about the charges against me, Drea said, come on, who will believe all that? That's why they call them allegations. Being the lioness that she is, Drea said her number one priority was keeping our kids shielded from the media madness in our lives. Although our divorce was imminent, one of Drea's comments in the Essence article touched my heart. Whatever happens to us, I will still love that man till the day I die. Her faith in my innocence took some of the bitterness out of our divorce, but it was still a tremendous blow. As a kid, I'd always dreamed of a happily ever after marriage. The destruction of that dream was heartbreaking for anyone, Drew and me, and especially the kids. And I knew it was over. After I knew that all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again, I decided to go to the movies to get away from it all. I went by myself and saw a love story called The Notebook. I loved every minute of that film. It was about a man and a woman from a different walk of life who had it, who made it through obstacles. Their relationship was challenged, their love was conquered, and through those challenges. In the end, living in an old age home, they died in each other's arms as the film credits started to roll. I couldn't move. I burst into tears. People walking past me, patting me on the back, trying to console me. The notebook was beautiful and I was crying because its hero and heroine had died together. But it was but I was also crying because I remembered a Valentine's Day when a helicopter dropped a rain full of roses that had come and gone. My marriage had died and there was nothing I could do to bring it back. Still waiting. The title track had me reunited with Snoop and on other tracks I ho I hooked up with Swiss Beat, Nelly, Chameleon, T. I. T. Pain, Usher, Huey, Ludacris, Kid Rock, and Don and Keisha Cole. There's a story behind the first single. I'm a Flirt remix. Originally, I'd done the song for Bow Wow's album, and it was supposed to be his second single. But when I got a copy of the album, the song wasn't there anywhere. Turns out that he they had made it a bonus track. I love the song, and I didn't want it to go to waste, so I decided to remix it and do my own version. I called it T-I-N-T Pain to get on the track with me. And they blessed the record. From a bonus track on someone else's album, I'm a Flirt remix, went to number one on the rap chart, number two on the hip hop and R&B charts, and 12 on the Hot 200 chart. Double Up hit number one in collaborations, including Same Girl, my duet with Usher were big hits, but the two songs that got the most attention were the ones that used the metaphors, The Zoo and Sex Planet. For reasons I can't explain, the song became a big hit with indie rockers and made number one number one of their 10 lists in 2007. On the street, though, the song that people were talking about was Real Talk. It was raw. It was funny. It was real. I made my first viral video for Real Talk, low budget and raw, straight to the point. As years after went by and the trial drew closer, my frustration sometimes got the best of me. I pray for calmness and acceptance. Sometimes I got it, sometimes I didn't. I felt like a caged beast. I got tired of being behind the bars of judgment. I was wary of folks assuming they knew everything about my life, assuming I just had to be guilty. And people thinking the worst of me. I was just tired of it all. At the same time, I was listening to up and coming singers copying my style from the sound of the vocals to the way I write and to the way I sing. I understand I bit off the styles of Charlie Wilson, Aaron Hall, just like Ray Charles and that King Cole style at the start of his career. Like everyone else, we need some role models until we develop our own musical personalities. Everybody starts out singing what they know. 
were played in their houses, their neighborhoods, and on the radio. It's just the way it is. In the beginning, it was flattering, but then it became annoying when certain singers started creating press for themselves by bad-mouthing me. Suddenly, they were telling me what to do. From the first day when I started into this musical industry to this very day, I would never in a million years tell Stevie Wonder what he should do with his music. I have too much respect for the man. He came before me and paved the way for every single that came after him. He will never hear me criticizing anything done by Stevie Wonder or Marvin Gaye, Sam Cooke, or Curtis Mayfield. They taught me and inspired me. When the press asked for my reaction, I wouldn't even discuss it. I didn't want to play into the hands of media hungry up and comers. But wait a minute. Kells, one reporter press. This young singer has given his opinion to you. Shouldn't you respond? No, I insisted because opinions should be born out of the right motive. These op opinions you're discussing come only from people looking for publicity for themselves. That's all you have to say, he asked. One other thing I added, elephants don't swat flies. Who am I? Who I am that to be loved for those who I am not. The trial. May 9, 2008, the final legal nightmare was about to get underway. Amid all the media hoopla, the day was finally here, the day of reckoning. Two weeks before the trial, though, a woman had popped out of nowhere with a new accusation. Our private investigators checked her out. They advised me that she was not a credible witness. Nonetheless, my attorneys were nervous. This was the first time I saw them sweat. They said they thought I should cop a plea, but I'm not guilty, I said. We know that, but you'll get less time if you cop. And we're not likely... We're not liking the way the jury is looking. Well, I'm liking the way the jury is looking, I countered. I think they believe. I don't think those people want me to go to jail. The prosecutors are offering you a deal that means only eight months in jail. If the jury is looking at to be against me, why is the prosecutor looking to deal? I asked. Look, Rob, they said, you do what you want, but you're extremely nervous. Eight months isn't bad. What's bad is, is even one day. What's bad is the seven years that I've had this court case hanging over my head. One day in jail means that I've copped to those charges. How can I have a career behind that? Eight months is better than 15 years. My business manager motioned me into a separate room and said, Rob, I think the judge is against you and the jury will follow. I think you should take the deal. I snapped on his ass and said, man, don't ever go against me. I got God with me. I got my gut instinct telling me to do what's right. I don't need you to tell me to cave in. He kept quiet. As we went back in the room with the lawyers, you made a decision, Robert, they asked. I'm not copping to nothing. I said, just do the job I'm paying you to do. We will, they said, but don't say we didn't warn you. Before that moment when people asked if I was afraid, I said, no, just a little scared. My attorney's words, though, put fear in my heart. Yet my faith was still there. Faith got me to sleep the night before the trial. Faith got me up in the morning. Faith got me dressed in the courtroom on time. Faith got me to stick to my decision. No deal. My lawyers managed to show that some of the witnesses who testified against me were angry at me for personal reasons that had nothing to do with the case. Some of the witnesses contradicted themselves in their testimony, which made it hard to believe them. Of all the witnesses who had testified against me, everyone was angry at me for personal reasons that had nothing to do with the case. One claimed I had promised him a recording deal. Another was mad that I didn't loan him money. Each was prejudiced. Each was looking for his 15 minutes of fame up there on the stage. My attorney, Ed Jensen, with his expert cross-examination, caught many of them in a web of contradictions. I knew my case was strong, but when the prosecutor stood and gave her closing argument, man, she was really strong. She almost had me believing I was guilty. She painted me as the most dangerous man on earth. She was downright brutal. I figured, though, this was her job. Tomorrow, she's, she'd be in another courtroom calling some other dude the most dangerous man in the world. Next was the closing arguments by one of my lawyers. I prayed for him to be as persuasive as the prosecutor, and he was. He was great. The jury was instructed to deliberate, so we waited an hour, then two, then three, then four, then six, then seven and a half hours later, we were told a verdict had been reached. But back to the courtroom, back to my seat, surrounded by my legal team, the wait wasn't over. The judge 
hadn't returned to the courtroom. Meanwhile, I was sweating. Then out of nowhere, a man handed me a card from his cigar shop. He whispered in my ear, I know you love stogies and we'd love to have you out to try some of our merchandise. I gave him a half smile. I wasn't sure what his gesture meant. I told my attorney what had just happened and asked him if that was a good sign. Yes, he said, but he wasn't smiling. Finally, the judge entered and called for the jury. As they walked in, I watched their faces. Count for count, the judge asked the chief juror what they had found. I heard the words not guilty spoken 12 times, not guilty on every count, over and over. The policeman in the courtroom, um, who up until the verdict had been read, acted like real hard asses. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We're not smiling and shake. We're not smiling and shaking my hand. I felt like the world was hugging me. Heaven was hugging me. Someone from MTV managed to snag an interview with the attorney immediately after the trial. My lawyer broke it all down, explaining exactly why the jury found me not guilty. The prosecutor's star or surprise witness never took the stand, including the woman that the prosecution believed to be the woman in the tape, in spite of her disposition to the contrary. The Chicago Sun-Times reporter Jim DeRogatis, who broke the story and was the first to receive the supposed sex tape, took the fifth and refused to testify. Instead, jurors had to rely on testimonies of con men and hustlers, he explained. He specifically mentioned one individual, the fiancé of the state's key witness, in the attempt to solicit a payoff from me. He is an absolute extortionist and tried to extort me personally, my attorney told MTV. I was angry about that. I am upset about that. I went down there and they absolutely hit me up for $350,000 that Mr. Kelly was supposed to pay. I heard the words, not guilty. As for me, I was too emotional to give any interviews. After the verdict was read, I went to the bathroom, and broke down and cried. I had to share that moment with my mother in heaven. I could feel her crying alongside me. The moment one flood of tears ended, I burst into another. I just couldn't stop crying and I couldn't stop thanking God as I left the courtroom. Tears flowed freely as people blew kisses, slapped me on the back, congratulated me or wished me well. I was so dazed, I felt like I was being kidnapped. When I got to my car, my boys snatched me inside. Marvin Sapp, the gospel great, was blasting on the radio, singing a song I've, I've sung at my shows. I never would have made it, praising the one and only God who saw me through. Within minutes, my phone was blowing up. People had testified against me, were calling to apologize to say that they really hadn't meant it. Did I forgive them? Yeah, I forgave them. I just wanted to get back to my normal life. Where do you want to go? My crew asked. McDonald's, I said. <laughs> I've got to get a double cheeseburger and some fries. And some fries. <laughs> Victory. My dream was about to finally come true. I'd been invited to Africa. And now after the trial with my passport restored, that time was right. My trip to Africa in 2009 was monumental for me. I was excited to perform at two VIP concerts at the close of the Arise African Fashion Awards, an annual event that spot most fans there had grown up listening to my music, but had never seen me. Because the visit was a long time coming, I was overwhelmed by raw, pure love. The last time I had that feeling was back when I was street performing. My first visit to Africa reminded me of the time when there was no pressure to live up to a megastar's image. African people just accepted me and loved me without really knowing me. It was one of the highlights of my career and the beginning of the relationship that would help me define the global significance of my music. While there, I felt like Ali. I jogged in the streets with the kids for two days. I ran drills and trained with the South African Army. Night after night, fans sang my name in their songs. I met Winnie Mandela and she took me on a tour of Soweto. I was invited to Nelson Mandela's house, which had more security than an airport. I was humbled and honored to meet the great man. Madiba, as he is called by the people of South Africa, was surrounded by many of his children and grandchildren. One of his great granddaughters, Zinani, was a fan of mine and wouldn't let me out of her sight. When I sat down at the piano to sing my song, Soldier's Heart, you stood on the front line. You led the way right out of the darkness. You could have let us go astray. 
you were ready to die for our sake. That takes a soldier's heart and dedicated it to her grandfather, Zanani Mandela, sat right next to me on the piano bench. Meanwhile, back in the States, I released my ninth studio album, Untitled. In 2008, I had originally planned to release it as 12 Play Fourth Quarter, but when all the material leaked by way of the internet, I had no choice but to scrap the idea and start from scratch. In the meantime, a management associate suggested that I release my first mixtape for the streets to tide fans over. It was also around that time that I was approached by Clive Davis to work with Whitney Houston on her comeback album. I did two songs for the album and one of them, I Look To You, was the first single and hit number one for Whitney. The untitled album debuted in December 2009 at number four on the Billboard 200 chart with the big club hit. Superman High featured um, Juice Man and Carrie Hilson. I also... Um, I also produced a song called Pregnant, which blended my voice with Tyrese, Robin Thicke, and The Dream. Soon after the release of Untitled, my longtime consultant and producer of Trapped in the Closet, Ann Carley, told me that FIFA, the international association that governs world soccer, was seeking submission for a special album being created for the 2010 FIFA World Cup Games, which were to be held in South Africa. The first time a World Cup match would be played on the continent of Africa. They were also looking for three special songs to present the game. The World Cup mascots theme, the closing ceremony song, and the final official anthem of the World Cup. Um, with my, She warned me that it was a long shot, that every artist in the world was trying to get one of those slots, and that even though I had been found innocent in the case, many corporate brands might still shy away from my association with me. With my basketball mentality, I can get really competitive. The opportunity to have my song considered as the anthem of the World's Cup and the fact that it was a long shot got my adrenaline pumping over time. I went to the bookstore and brought, bought every book and DVD I had on soccer and immersed myself in my research. I watched soccer on TV, ran drills with the Chicago Fire Soccer Club, which was one of the USA teams to get a better feel for the game. I watched Invictus, the Clint Eastwood film starring Morgan Freeman and Matt Damon about how Nelson Mandela used rugby to help unite the people of South Africa during the 1995 Rugby World Cup. I didn't want to write a song that was just about soccer or the World Cup. I wanted it to be bigger than that. I believe music can guide us into a world peace and I wanted a song that could speak to humanity on a global scale. I dug deep inside to find something that would inspire people like I Believe I Can Fly had inspired millions. In the same way that I Believe I Can Fly wasn't just about basketball, I wanted another song that explored the known and the unknown. We know we're missing love in this world. We know we need to love to survive, but we don't know how to get there. I searched for the words that spoke to the healing possibilities of love. Keep in mind, my trial and victory were still fresh in my mind. I've always said that the depths of my struggle will determine the height of my success. If there's no fire, there's no scream. If there's no scream, then no one can hear or come to help. No continent had struggles more than Africa, especially South Af Africa. And a sign of a victory is a testimony to its struggle. It's about what Africa has been through, what it is going through, and mainly what Africa will overcome. I can feel the spirit of the nations. I can feel my wings riding the winds. Yes, I see the finish line just ahead now, and I can feel it rising deep within, and that's a sign of a victory. We're going to stop right there. We have two more ch two more chapters, and we will be done with Solar Coaster, and um, I will pick up on Monday. Wow. The trial, it seems very very uh, connected and very normal to what's going on in 2021. I think it's a continuance of what they could not get him on in 2008. But the sign of a victory is emotion. It's in rotation. What are you feeling right now? Um, I know there are some people, some naysayers, some haters, some, some just uh, propagandists that are putting flooding things on the internet 
Some are saying, you know, crazy things like, oh, you know, I don't even want to put them on my channel. The things that I'm hearing, some of the some of the things that are being um, spoken in the comments that I have to delete. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, um, you've seen them because sometimes it takes me a while to get to all of the comments. However, I've also seen a flood and influx of subscribers and I thank everyone for subscribing. But when I go and I click on the subscribers uh, profile to look at what they've done and on YouTube, I noticed that a few of them are little kids. So I do want to announce to um, the youth that this is not a channel for kids. There's nothing here for children. Um, I do believe that uh, some parents are not being watchful of what their kids are putting out on some of the subscribers um, channels that I'm connected to right now. And I do see little things such as um, children uh, performing acts um, such as, you know, exercising and flipping and doing the kids stuff. But it does not affiliate or associate with, say, this channel. Now, I understand that the parents may know. So the children may have these, these um, you know, videos being put out there by their parents. Okay. But I see little kids recording the um, acts and then there's no parent there. So I just want you to know, little children, that it is not good to try to sell yourself for money or to entice or impress yourself behind a camera to get um, attention. There's a million other creative ways that we can do things in our lives that could potentially create a positive outcome. And this right here, R. Kelly Appeal TV, is all about Robert Sylvester Kelly and um, and about his success. This is not about trying to figure out how the next group of groupies can come in and try to manipulate a situation because you think that that's going to impress or entice him. This is not what this channel is for. So if you think it is, please unsubscribe and move on to a new channel. But if you are here for the love and for the blessings and support and the empowerment of Robert Sylvester Kelly to move him from this stage of his life into the um, promises of what he should have been enduring during the time of his retirement, then I think you are welcome. You are a blessing to be here and we will see you next time. Peace and blessings. Have a great weekend and as always, keep it 100.